Let's be clear, you don't have to be Jewish to care about anti-Semitism. Here are five things you didn't know. Number one, most people think anti-Semitism is as old as the hills, but not really. We can't really talk about anti-Semitism, or more correctly, anti-Judaism, before the birth of Christianity. In antiquity, it wasn't uncommon for one nation, tribe, or ethnic group to persecute or basically beat up another. Jews were no exception, being targeted as far back as the exodus from Egypt. And centuries later, we are told of a plot hatched in the days of Queen Esther to destroy the Jews of Persia. There was also a general persecution of the Jews in the land of Israel in the second century BCE under the Seleucid dynasty of Syria. That led to a guerrilla war spearheaded by the Maccabees and culminating in the Feast of Hanukkah. But while religious and ethnic persecution was certainly present in the ancient world, it was sporadic in nature. You couldn't properly call anti-Jewish incidents in the Greco-Roman world anti-Semitism. In fact, the ancient world was, by and large, a fairly tolerant place. As empires grew, they absorbed multiple polyglot peoples, the end result being cultural syncretism. The general attitude was, you worship your gods or goddesses, and I'll worship mine, and perhaps we can find some overlap among our deities. Jews, of course, stubbornly resisted cultural and religious syncretism, which did provoke occasional hostility. But even as a degree of hatred against Jews grew in Greco-Roman society, there was also a degree of admiration of Jews that took root in the ancient classical world, with many deciding to convert to the Jewish faith. Whatever animosity existed, we might properly call anti-Judaism, but we can't really call it anti-Semitism. With the birth of Christianity, however, new and sinister currents of anti-Judaism began to emerge as the crucifixion of Jesus came to be blamed on the Jewish people. In Christian preaching and teaching on the Jews, Catholic saints, including Augustine, John Chrysostom, and Thomas Aquinas, and Protestant reformers, such as John Calvin and Martin Luther, appear united in their teaching of contempt of the Jewish way contrasting it with God's grace and love. It was the venerable St. Augustine who declared, Judaism, since Christ, is a corruption. Indeed, Judas is the image of the Jewish people. Their understanding of scripture is carnal. They bear the guilt for the death of the Savior. He also wrote, Throughout all nations there have been scattered abroad the Jews witnesses of their own iniquity and our truth. Sadly, such words were mashed with action, resulting in the systematic exclusion of Jews from Christian society across Europe. Such widespread persecution never occurred in pagan Rome or any of the other pagan societies of antiquity. And hard as it is to swallow, a fairly good case could be made that what became anti-Semitism had its roots specifically in Christian lands. The late Christian theologian Franklin Littell stated, I think Christian anti-Semitism laid foundations, a bottom layer, if you will, not only in Germany, but in all of Christendom, so-called, on which cultural stereotypes and prejudices were then built as a second layer. Number two, anti-Semitism began as anti-Judaism, which was religious in nature. But after centuries of anti-Jewish agitation in Christian Europe, motivated by the charge that the Jews are Christ killers, the phenomenon shifted in the 19th century from religious to racial. The hatred of Jews could no longer be purely religiously motivated. After all, ever since the Enlightenment, religion played a smaller and smaller role in European thought and culture. There would simply have to be other grounds for anti-Jewish prejudice. 
As long as anti-Jewish sentiment was based on religion, then at least in theory, a Jew might escape from persecution by the simple act of converting to Christianity. Not a few Jews did this, giving rise to suspicion that their conversions were insincere. And that in turn led to the famous Spanish Inquisition. Now, however, Jewishness was defined as something in the blood for which no Christian conversion could atone, however sincere. During the Nazi era, countless Jews flocked to Christian churches to obtain baptismal certificates. But according to German law, such attempts to hide one's identity were of no avail. Secular European culture inherited its anti-Semitism from its religious past, but it was now reframed in Darwinian terms as a kind of survival of the fittest. This was pointed out by history professor at Cal State University, Richard Weichart, in his famous book, From Darwin to Hitler, Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism in Germany. Number three, the term anti-Semitism wasn't invented until the late 1800s. The so-called father of modern anti-Semitism was a disillusioned democratic German revolutionary named Wilhelm Marr. According to Marr, anti-Semitism must focus on the racial, not the religious characteristics of Jews. In organizing the League of Anti-Semites, he introduced the term anti-Semite into public speech and brought about history's first popular movement focusing solely on anti-Jewish attitudes. In 1879, his book, The Victory of Judaism Over Germandom, was published. Contrary to many other anti-Semitic tracts, Marr's analysis of the Jewish question posits the world historical triumph of Jewry and announces the news of a lost battle. His text concludes with the resounding words, Finis Germanie, Germany's end. But for anti-Semitism, it was only the beginning. Number four, what Franklin Littell called cultural stereotypes and prejudices were perpetrated by the most notorious and widely distributed anti-Semitic publication of modern times called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Its exact origins are unknown, but found its way into print in the early 1900s in Russia. It purported to consist of conversations among a secretive cabal of Jewish financial moguls intent on dominating the world. Not long after the Russian Revolution of 1917, the protocol surfaced across Europe, having been carried by anti-Bolshevik emigres. It also appeared in the United States, South America, and Japan, along with an Arabic translation in the 1920s. At the same time, automobile magnate Henry Ford published a series of articles based on the protocols in his newspaper, The Dearborn Independent. A book that included these articles, called The International Jew, was highly praised by none other than Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels. The protocols continue to circulate around the world today and are easily accessed on the internet. It should come as no surprise when Kanye West, who now goes by Yi, essentially declared open season on the Jews, tweeting that he would go to DEFCON 3 on the Jewish people. DEFCON, not DEFCON, is an abbreviation of the term Defense Readiness Condition, used to measure safety alerts with five levels in total. DEFCON 1 is the most serious, signaling nuclear war. In a later interview, Kanye, or Yi, said that his DEFCON 3 remarks referred to when black musicians sign to Jewish record labels and those Jewish record labels take ownership, a form of modern-day slavery. The Anti-Defamation League said his remarks use age-old anti-Semitic myths about Jewish greed and power and control of the entertainment industry. Anti-Semitism today finds a political home on both the right and the left. 
In February 19, a Minnesota congresswoman, known for her far left-leaning views, Ilhan Omar, tweeted that U.S. support for Israel was all about the Benjamins. A reference to the $100 bill adorned by Benjamin Franklin's face. In another tweet, Omar named the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC, saying it was funding Republican support for Israel. There was bipartisan backlash, and Omar was widely accused of anti-Semitic speech. Number five. After World War II, anti-Semitism isn't really the same as earlier expressions of anti-Jewish hatred. But it's not different either. Not the same because it has spread across radicalized portions of the Arab Islamic world rather than being headquartered in old Europe. Not different because it has been imported back into Europe, being found in ever more virulent forms among the continent's Muslim population and fanning out to non-Muslim communities as well. It employs tactics and stereotyping that might have been lifted right out of the Nazi propaganda machine. As Phyllis Chesler points out in her 2005 book, The New Antisemitism, this old-fashioned hatred has become newly fashionable, even politically correct, threatening the Jews of the world, America, and Western civilization. It adds to the old demonization of the state of Israel which many in Europe are now willing to jettison along with the Jewish people as a whole for the sake of easing tensions with radical elements in the Muslim population. Today, lethal activism against the Jews often takes the form of anti-Zionism. Some say that today anti-Semitism is back with a vengeance, but then again, it never really abated, did it? What kind of disturbing things do we see around us today? Synagogues torched or shot up with worshipers inside, Jewish cemeteries defaced, Jews attacked on the streets. No, this isn't Germany in the 1930s. It's continental Europe and indeed the United States. And it's happening today. Welcome to the 21st century.